Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very glad to be here with you all today. Have a fantastic discussion ahead of us. We're really honored to welcome Dr. Carter Malkazian uh, to our, our lunchtime webinar today. He has just published what I would describe as the authoritative um, history on the American war in Afghanistan. I personally have a threshold of when I buy a, a physical book and when I put it on my Kindle, and that is when I'm going to know I'm going to highlight a significant portion of the book. I actually purchased this version of it, and so far that has absolutely been the case with this book. Carter is um, the, one of the premier experts on Afghanistan, and he is this really wonderful and rare combination of a rigorous scholar, a, a deep historian, who's had a ton of experience in Afghanistan as well. He was the special assistant for the Joint Chiefs of the uh, Chairman, General Dunford, for a number of years. He spent two years in Afghanistan uh, working on the ground as part of a civilian team there. He is now with CNA and is, is publishing his research there. His, this is not his first book on Afghanistan either. And he really comes to this with a, a really deep knowledge, not only of Afghanistan, but of the, the US system as well. And he really brings that together beautifully in this book. So I'm really honored to, to welcome Dr. Malkazian to American here today to talk about his book. So thank you so much for being here today, Carter. Uh, hi, Trisha. Thank you so much for the wonderful uh, for, for for the wonderful introduction. It's great to be here today talking to the the, the students and professors and teachers of, of American University. Um, and so, what I thought I'd do is I'd um, talk a little bit um, for about twenty or thirty minutes, and then we'll shift over to question and answer. I suspect there's a lot of questions that folks have about what's happened over the past month, or maybe even uh, the news today about the announcement of a new of a new Taliban cabinet. Um, but what I wanted to talk about um, was looking at the Afghan war um, since 2001 and try to give some understanding about why it turned out the way it did. In other words, why did we lose? Um, and But also look at why our policy became the way it did, why we couldn't get out, why we stayed for so long. Because I think those two intertwined questions, one, why we lost, and the other one, why we didn't leave, I think are pretty key to our understanding um, of the war. So I want to explain first um, why we lost. And my thinking about this has changed over time. So I thought I'd go through it kind of step by step how I've how I've come to be thinking about it. I had a lot, I've had a lot of interest since 2007, 2008 in terms of how things went awry in Afghanistan. Why were we, why were we facing so many problems early on? I really started investigating this question when I started working in Garmsir District, Helmand Province from 2009 to 2011. Garmsir is a, a farming area close to the desert, uh, was controlled by the Taliban for a good amount of time. And when I went there um, as a civilian, but working alongside Marines, um, we were trying to remove the Taliban from the district, enable the government to stand on its own, um, bring some kind of peace and stability. And I was um, irrationally hopeful at that time. I thought it might be possible to, to make more of a difference. But again, I was interested in why we hadn't succeeded yet. So the one thing that really stuck in my mind coming in at that point is the idea of grievances. Uh, the idea that the Afghan people were upset um, by how their government had treated them, how various warlords had treated them, and to some extent, how our forces might have treated them in night raids or in, in, in uh, causing civilian casualties in, in various bombings. And that was a lot of those based on earlier studies of Afghanistan and Sarah Che's classic book, uh, The Punishment of Virtue. So when I went to Garmsir, I indeed saw some of these things. Um, there was lots of evidence of grievances. There were land issues in which large parts of the community didn't have their own land. Um, and the government might not recognize their land or might take land away from them. Um, there were also the problem of uh, policemen who were oppressive, taxing people or wrongly imprisoning people. And I also could see um, government exploitation of the poppy trade. So the government would protect the people who are on its side who are growing poppy, but go after the people that weren't on its side or that might have been its adversaries in the past um, to go after their poppy. And all of that built resistance amongst the people. And it made many of the people want to give shelter to the Taliban, on to support the things that the Taliban were saying. So that was clear, but that was not all. That's not everything that happened. 
I realized that it couldn't explain everything. So for one thing, Garmson really first faces um, the problem of the Taliban after 2001, when the Taliban come and recapture most of the district. And they do that by hundreds of Taliban coming all over the border from Pakistan um, to, to capture most of the district. So that adds another part to it. This was not an internal rebellion that caused the government to fall. It was military forces coming from another country. Now, most of those people, again, those Taliban, they were Afghans, they weren't Pakistanis. And many of them had been from families that were originally from Garmsir in the first place. But nevertheless, it highlights the problem of safe havens. The problem that you have this vast area on the border of, of Afghanistan where the Taliban could organize, get weapons, train, and when they were immune, um, protected from any kind of strikes from the United States or the Afghan government itself. So it really put that in addition to grievances, we had to think about Pakistan as a reason. But even this can't explain everything. War is a competition between two sides. It plays out in the execution of violence. The Taliban still had a battle to win once they reached my district of Narmsir, um, and that begs why the government couldn't succeed in that battle. So the reason the government couldn't succeed is they had barely any forces at the time. There were uh, some, something like 15 police left um, by that period of time. There weren't many militia left whatsoever. So the, the Taliban were largely able to walk right in. This had happened because the government forces had been at odds with each other for years, disputing over profits, disputing over money, disputing over political power. So over time, the various competitors tried to disarm one, one another. And that meant that by 2006, there weren't any government forces ready to fight. There were no militias there anymore. They had all gone to ground. At the same time, we hadn't built up an army or a police force that was strong enough to counter the Taliban then. So that added another explanation to what was happening in Afghanistan. I left Armstrong in 2011. Um, I returned to Afghanistan in 2013 as a political advisor, General Dunford, who's then the commander of all U.S. forces in Afghanistan. From there, I was able to see the country from a wider vista and able to see what was happening in a broad variety of places, not just this little district of Garmsir. I learned that a similar process to what had happened in Garmsir had happened in some other places. Um, Argandab, Panjwe, Zari, some places in Ghazni, um, some places in Pakti and Paktika. But I could also see that something else was going on when I was there with General Dunford. The Afghan forces were still having difficulty defeating the Taliban. Too often, when they didn't have our support, they would lose. Now, at that point, it's not like what happened last month. They would be fighting hard, but in the end, the Taliban would have the edge and succeed. And it, it was just difficult to see without our support how they were gonna, how they were gonna win. On um, grievances, Pakistan and infighting, they could explain some of this, but not all of it. Every incident of battlefield defeat couldn't be explained by the things that I had seen in Garmsir. So I, I looked towards some other things. So corruption within the police and army was one factor. Corruption is something we've now heard a lot about. As is well known, the effectiveness of soldiers and police suffered because Kabul um, or their own commanders pocketed their pay, hoarded their ammunition, or diluted their rosters with ghost soldiers. They'd often say that there were um, that they had a full roster, so they could collect all the pay for that full roster, but that full roster wasn't matched by actual people, so they could pocket that money. Often also plenty of evidence that promotions required pay up to Kabul, plenty of evidence that soldiers and such would tax, tax the people themselves to get money. So that meant that the police and army on the front lines didn't have the kind of ammunition, didn't have the pay, didn't have the supplies, didn't have the manpower they were supposed to have. But even this argument can only go so far because the painful thing about Afghanistan is that we've seen over and over again that small numbers of Taliban have defeated larger numbers of government forces. When, and when those government forces had more guns, more ammo um, than the Taliban had, that is readily apparent when we see all of the M16s all of the Ford Ranger pickups and all of the Humvees that the Taliban are now readily driving around in. So how can we explain that? Well, the stronger argument in pure corruption alone is that the corruption and other mis and problems of the government 
meant that the police and the army and police and the soldiers didn't want to put their lives on the line for a government that was prone to neglect them and not help them. About two weeks ago, Sammy Sadat, who was the Corps commander in Helmand, he made this point, among some other points, that the, that the soldiers of the government just weren't willing to fight because they thought the government was going to abandon them. So this argument, I think, is more powerful explaining what was happening. But still, I think it's probably not sufficient. Now, for one thing, we have examples of Afghan army commanders who did fight really hard, many of whom died on the front line. Um, who tried to do the right thing and tried to keep their forces supplied. Yet their forces too could have a great deal of difficulty um, succeeding. And I, I also wonder how can we say that the key deficiency is the government leaders didn't care about their soldiers when we know the Taliban fight for less money. The Taliban are, are, don't have the same level of supplies, have fewer weapons, have awful medical care. Um, and the Taliban key leaders are not in Afghanistan, or for most of the world, we're not in Afghanistan. They were in Pakistan or in Iran. So when you compare the, the leadership, you, we might be able to say that the leadership of the Taliban was a little bit better, but you, it doesn't look to be greatly better than what the government was providing. Um, and then what to make of the Afghan special forces, which we all acknowledge, better trained, um, well-equipped, um, largely known to be the best military forces in Afghanistan. Why do they also fail to defeat the Taliban when they're on their own without our support? So that feeling left me as I left Afghanistan in 2014, when I, when I went on to be an advisor to the Chairman of the Joint Staff, General Dunford again, in the Pentagon, I was trying to understand more of what was happening, go back to Afghanistan several times for various things. Um, and try to understand what was actually happening in Afghanistan. And over time, and I want to emphasize this is not something I realized when I began all this, um, is that the Taliban exemplifies something. The Taliban exemplifies something that inspires, something that made them powerful in battle. And it's closely tied to what it meant to be Afghan. In simple terms, they fought for Islam and resistance to occupation, which are values enshrined in Afghan identity. Aligned with foreign occupiers, the government couldn't muster any similar kind of inspiration. It couldn't get its supporters, even if they outnumbered the Taliban, to go to the same lengths. Its claims to Islam were fraught. The very presence of our forces on it in Afghanistan trod on what it meant to be Afghan. It prodded men and women to defend their honor, their religion, and their home. It dared young men to fight. And it sapped the will of the Afghan soldiers and police. When they clash, Taliban more, war, more willing to kill and be killed than the Afghan soldier or police was willing to be. So this explanation has come up in a variety of conversations I've had over the years, usually in Pashto with Taliban, with Afghan military commanders, Afghan government officials, tribal leaders. It's easy to find this in official and unofficial Taliban statements. They'll make that, they'll make it readily. They'll also say it when, when, when you talk to them, talk to them face to face. And for a long time, we viewed this as propaganda, but I think we might be, um, that might be dis, dis, missing what's standing right in front of our face. Um, so when I was back in Afghanistan in 2018 and 2019, a Taliban religious scholar from Kandahar told me the Taliban fight for belief, for Janat, heaven, for Ghazi, killing infidels. The army and police fight for money. The Taliban are willing to lose their heads to fight how can the army and police compete with the Taliban? Um, you know, another good example of this is if you the um, Taliban, when their soldiers were buried, even in a government controlled area, it would be known that they would be buried, being buried there and there would be a ceremony. If an Afghan soldier was buried, often there wouldn't be a ceremony. Often it would be on a plot on the back part of someone's property, not in the common, um, uh, cemetery, because the two were viewed entirely differently. The Afghan, the Taliban is viewed as Shaheed, a martyr. The Afghan soldier is viewed as simply someone, simply someone who died. Um, this explanation is also evident when I mine Kipashu texts uh, written by the Taliban. You can see in the poetry um, that they write and the histories that they write. The thing I really want to stress is one of the two things I really want to stress is one is testimonials of Taliban in key battles. You can look at some of the key battles that have been fought since 2015, 
Kunduz, stuff around Lashkargah, some of the other battles around Kandahar. And, and you can find testimonials of Taliban saying that they are fighting for their belief, they're fighting um, to resist occupation, whereas government forces will say, we're not sure what we're fighting for. It's not clear if we're fighting for the government. And so it's clear that the Taliban have something to fight for, whereas the government does not. Now, most convincingly is multiple surveys of the Taliban since 2007. Um, it was repeatedly seen that the Taliban fight because they believe it's their Islamic duty to resist occupation, and they're convinced that their cause will enable them to win. It's in the 2012 uh, Asia Foundation survey and several other Asia Foundation surveys um, that show that um, uh, that people thought that they people sympathize with the Taliban because they were Afghans, Muslims, and Wajin Jihad. On um, various other surveys, uh, sometimes of large numbers of, of Taliban, sometimes small numbers of Taliban have been conducted uh, since that time. One of the best, I think, is conducted by Ashley Jackson. Um, and her, in her findings, she said that she discovered Taliban members described their decision to join the movement in terms of religious devotion, jihad, a sense of personal and public duty. In their view, jihad against foreign occupation was a religious obligation undertaken to defend values. And she concluded jihad was about identity. Um, so I think this explanation of Islam and resistance is powerful because it explains and it gives answers to questions that arguments about grievances, Pakistan, or corruption cannot. So I think it's important to look at this as, 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 as an explanation to what's happening, has happened in Afghanistan. But I want to stress, it is also not the singular explanation for the outcome of the Afghan war. It's one explanation along with the other ones that I mentioned. It's an, it is important because it alludes that any Afghan government, however good and however democratic, would, could still have problems on fighting the Taliban and could still be imperiled as long as it was aligned with the United States. And that kind of creates a kind of um, cycle for us. The government's imperiled without us. We support the government. As we continue to support the government, it continues to face, us, face problems. It's like civil war in perpetual motion. Um, but this explanation is also dangerous, which is the other thing I really need to emphasize here. It can be misinterpreted as meaning that all Afghans or all Muslims are bent on war or worse are fanatics. And that's really not what I'm trying to say here whatsoever. Um, I'm not trying to say that Islam itself is some kind of source of terrorism or atrocity. Um, what I'm trying to say is that it's tougher to risk life for country when fighting alongside what some would call occupiers especially when those occupiers believe in a different religion. Um, so this is, I mean, I think to, to say that if people have sympathy for their countrymen and co-religionists over foreigners is hardly to say Islam is a root of evil. I think it's more just to recognize the situation for what the situation is. Um, so that's how I see why we didn't do well in the war or why we were unable to win the war. Let's switch now for the last 10 minutes or so, hopefully a bit less, why didn't we just leave and curtail the expense? Why did we stay for so long in Afghanistan? And I think that from today's answer, the real tempting, the, 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 the tempting answer is we shouldn't have stayed so long. We just should have gotten out. We should have gotten out sometime after 2001 once the Taliban were toppled. I'm not sure that's helpful. For one thing, it presumes we would have understood the situation in Afghanistan much, much sooner than we actually did. Um, the other thing is it unrealistically dismisses the terrorist threat that was felt from 2001 onward and the very real domestic political implications of ignoring that terrorist threat. On um, the attacks of 11 September, they ignited a fear that terrorists, that, that, that presidents could not ignore. You know, previously, terrorist attacks were a minor irritation in the 1990s. They were the subject of movies that we would like to watch about fantastic things happening and action heroes. They weren't things that you saw really happening that often in real life until September 11th happened. And that brought up not just the risk that thousands of Americans could die in a single attack, it brought up the risk of chemical attacks, biological attacks, nuclear attacks. Because if terrorists were willing to drive planes into a building, then they surely would be willing to go further to cause more damage. The whole idea of deterring these kind of attacks fell apart. So this created a conundrum for every president. The president had to decide between spending resources of places in very low strategic value for the United States, Afghanistan in particular, or accepting some unknown risk of terrorist threat. 
or a terrorist attack. In the early years after 2001, the atmosphere was really charged with this risk, this fear of another attack on the homeland. Uh, throughout 2012, 50 to 80, 85 percent of Americans worried a terrorist attack on the United States was likely. This is in Gallup polls. Consequently, President Bush never considered declaring victory and going home. He was always determined to stay in Afghanistan. In fact, he thought that, that we could win and, and defeat the Taliban entirely. For a while, they thought they had defeated the Taliban. Um, him, him and, his, and the rest of his team felt that way, and they were just very sensitive to the domestic political risk if anything more went wrong, if there were more attacks on the United States. That terrorist threat, of course, recedes during Obama's presidency, but he too couldn't ignore it. We all forget that in, in 2009, Afghanistan was called the, the Good War. President Obama was ske very skeptical about surging forces in Afghanistan, but he was not skeptical about the need to keep on fighting in Afghanistan. And we have lots of documentary evidence available at this point about the discussions that were had in 2009. And at no point in it was there any discussion about actually leaving Afghanistan. There may have been discussions off to the side. Um, President, Vice President Biden and others may have voiced some concerns in various dinners and such that, that occurred here and there. But in terms of the actual debates that were going on, there's nothing to say that uh, our leadership thought that we should actually leave Afghanistan. And that's largely because doing so would have opened the new democratic administration to intense criticism, could have disturbed the larger domestic political agenda, and that included at that time saving the economy. It's only after the death of bin Laden that, go, that withdrawing actually became a real option. Um, and indeed, after that, um, President Obama pushed our forces down from the 100,000 height that they were at the surge down to around 10,000, which was a major change in our strategy at the time. And then he eventually announced in May of 2014 that all U.S. forces would leave in 2016. So he actually did um, create a policy for us to leave. It simply didn't work out in the end. Um, why didn't it work out in the end? Well, for one thing, in June of 2014, a month later, the Islamic State captured most of Iraq. The Islamic State then, and later in that year, in 2015, conducted attacks inside of uh, Europe and inside of the United States. So that raised a terrorist threat again, and was again a concern for, for the American people. While that was happening, the Taliban mount their own offensives in Afghanistan. The Battle of Kunduz, the infamous Battle of Kunduz happens there, which is a tragedy on many different levels. Um, and they also attack other provincial capitals. Intelligence assessments come out that say that, that the government could fall if the United States of US forces leave, and that the Taliban and that a terrorist safe haven could be recreated inside of Afghanistan. That evidence, the concerns about the Islamic State, and also some of the concerns about the effect of terrorist attacks on domestic politics in the United States pressed uh, President Obama to end his timeline and to keep US forces there in the number of about 8,600 after the end of his presidency in, 2014, in, tw in 2016. The same fate essentially befell President Donald Trump who wanted to get out of Afghanistan more strongly than any previous American president. And he did make a lot of ground in doing that in terms of the agreement that was signed with the Taliban that had a timeline for us to leave, and in terms of bringing our troops down to 2,500. But at the same time, throughout his presidency, he repeatedly cited concerns about a terrorist attack, repeatedly said the US, US could keep, should keep a CT presence in Afghanistan, talked about keeping intelligence assets there. So in the end, when he talked about going to zero after he lost the, the presidential election, he was dissuaded because of the concerns about what kind of threat could arrive to stay at 2,500 or 3,500, whatever the actual number is, it gets reported with different numbers. Now, when President Biden finally decided to leave, the strategic context had changed, I would argue. Now, I think there's lots of things in the press about how President Biden was always determined to leave and always would go in that direction. I think that's possible, but as a historian, I also want to point the important structural changes that had occurred by then. So for one thing, China and Russia had risen as threats, and there was a great deal of concern about what the United States needed to do about them. Um, for another thing, we had greater concerns about the U.S. economy 
after the recession uh, that, that occurred in 2008, and then the, the recession that has, has occurred and is hopefully over from COVID. Um, the terrorist threat itself has diminished dramatically. So the Islamic State and other groups are still there, but they've been drastically suppressed, largely because of the campaign against the Islamic State that occurred ending around 2018. The, and then the biggest thing probably is our viewpoint of other large threats, such as climate change, such as political stability within the United States, and such as COVID. It's a painful thing to say, but it's worth remembering that more people died of COVID at its height on a daily basis than died in the 9-11 attacks. More people per day at the height of COVID died than died on 11 September. So the strategic context had changed. Terrorism is less important to the United States. And as that shift occurred, that's what enabled, I believe, President um, Biden to leave. Now, of course, historians such as myself will have to interrogate that um, over, over time. But the other way to think Think about this, and perhaps the simplest answer as to why we didn't leave beforehand is because no president and no military leader wants to go through what just happened last month. And that's probably the simplest way to say it. So the idea that we should have gotten out kind of presumes the president's free to, free to pull the plug as he or she pleases, but in reality, getting out can be as difficult um, as prevailing. You know, it's one thing to say you're going to leave. It's another thing to actually do it. Look, peer over the brink, look at the rocks, look at the waters and decide you're actually going to jump. And this is the tragedy of America's Afghan war. Uh, we lost because of intractable grievances, Pakistani safe havens, intractable corruption, and a deep-seated Afghan sense of what their identity is. There were few chances to prevail and few chances to get out, which means that the most realistic view of Afghanistan might not be it's a war that could have been avoided, but it was a war that we were going to have to endure for all its costs and its, and its difficulties. An unwanted diversion of American history with scarce opportunities to change course. And um, that is my talk. I think I, I, I got under 30 minutes, so that's probably a good thing, but I, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Professor Bacon now. Thank you so much to chew on there. I, I left my own devices. I could keep you all day asking questions, but I won't do that to you. Um, I, I think your, your argument about the nature of, of what the Taliban was fighting for and the, the identity piece of it is, is a really novel contribution from the book. And one of the things I wanted to ask you was, was that did that kick in at some point, this, this idea of, of activating that Afghan identity of fighting against foreign occupation? Um, was there a grace period in the early years where the, the Afghan government was not viewed that way and the U.S. presence wasn't viewed that way? Or was that essentially baked in as soon as the U.S. entered the war? Because there's very different policy implications of the, those two possibilities. So that's a great question. Um, and it really and, and, and it gets to that we um, as a historian and, and as a political scientist too, we shouldn't expect causation to remain the same over time. We should expect that different causes um, have a different role at different different parts of time. Mm -hmm. um, so if I look at the documentary evidence, um, the, the available documentary evidence says the Taliban were and the certain Afghans were upset about our presence early but that it does really kick in after 2006 or so. Mm -hmm. And it kicks in in conjunction with the Taliban being able to mount an offensive in 2006. It wasn't just against arms, it was against other large parts of the country that reestablished them and their presence. Um, and, it, and that gives the Taliban more legitimacy as they, they say this is going on. And it makes a resist, and there's actually is a resistance for people to believe in and people to rally around. There actually is guilt that can be had about what side you are on, whereas before that wasn't really there to the same extent. Um, and then the Taliban, of course, are now propagandizing it to, to, to a much greater extent. At the same time as violence increases, so do our operations. That yeah. means more Afghans are killed, more damage is done, and that helps strengthen the divide that's there. So I think there can be an argument that's made that the idea of resistance to occupation gains momentum after two. 2006. Um, and the longer it happens, and then other events like the 2014 elections, where we're interceding to kind of to, to make the democracy work at that point, that paints both Abdul and Ghani as US puppets, 
that worsens the situation there. So we can see how it, it builds over time. However, that said, we should also be careful about what we think we knew between 2001 and 2005. Many Americans at that time believe that, um, well, identity, religion, resisting occupation, those are things of the past in Afghanistan. That's not, that's not the current in Afghanistan. Afghans have given up that sense of things. I think it is also possible that we miss things. We miss the signs about what was actually occurring and how Afghans didn't want to see foreigners around uh, so much. And maybe that'll come out more over time as, as there is more evidence available. It is very striking looking at what people written in secondary and primary sources from 2001 to 2005, how infrequently Islam or occupation was mentioned. Yeah. It could be lack of evidence. It could be that we were all um, um, biased towards our own blind spots. Mm -hmm. And again, this isn't an argument that I was making in 2001 and 2005 or even, even out in 2010 or 11. No, that 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 makes a lot of that makes a lot of sense, and I, I credit you for sort of evolving your arguments over time and with experience and, and and looking back at your own views critically. That isn't something I think we're always encouraged to do either in the government or as scholars. So I, I give you a lot of credit for doing that. Um, I I think that makes a, what you're saying makes a lot of sense, and the evolution of your thinking about it. Um, is probably one that that more people needed to go through um, and sort of constantly evaluating their their um, their assessments and their arguments. Um, bringing us to to some of the issues that you you talked about today, of course, there's the the specter of Pakistan is always a big one when we talk about the, the insurgency and, and how things went. But Pakistan has in a way gotten what it wished for in, in the outcome. Um, what do you how do you see the trajectory of Taliban Pakistan relations going forward now that the, the Taliban has formed its government? I think the Taliban will want to be viewed as independent. I think they, they've always wanted to be viewed as independent and not under Pakistan's thumb. I think the government itself will try to take some kind of action to prevent its members from being too controlled by, by Pakistan. Um, and they will probably try to announce their neutrality um, as, uh, as a nation, um, so as not to be stuck in the regional disputes of the area. But, <laughs> Um, they're going to need outside assistance, and that outside assistance is most readily coming from Pakistan. Um, they also have their pre-existing relations with Pakistan that, that will be hard to leave. And many of them have homes there and have shelter there for years. I'm not sure when all of the, app, the, the leadership that's in, in Pakistan now is going to go back there. So, and Pakistan, of course, is going to want to maintain its interest and the Taliban as its proxy, which is probably the most complicated thing for the Taliban to have to deal with. That if they don't stay as Pakistan, if they don't keep helping Pakistan, Pakistan may do to them what they did to Hezbi Islami, mm. which is try to find other people or other people within the movement. Pakistan may be perfectly happy with trying to fracture the movement in some way if it benefits them. Um, so I don't want to read too much into Pakistan because their foreign policy is also an unknown, but we can see how this is a real challenge um, for the uh, for the Taliban. How do you, I, we have a question from the audience about the um, ISK, uh, the Islamic State and Khorasan dimension to the, the picture going forward. Do you think that the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan will decrease the risk of defections to ISK, or are there still some scenarios where the Taliban has to worry about significant infections to ISK going forward? Overall, the, overall, the risk of defections has drastically decreased um, because the Taliban won. The Taliban, are the, it's not ISKP that defeated the United States. Yeah. It's not ISKP that overran all those cities and provincial centers. It's the Taliban. Mm. The Taliban are, are, are in the dominant position right now. So I would suspect the ISKP is going to have some defections going to the Taliban rather than the other way. Now, there's things that the Taliban, the Taliban do still have some problems in terms of the degree to which they suppress militants and go after terrorists could cause some people to go to, to ISKP. So they'd still have to be a little bit worried about how they treat that organization. Um, I'm not sure if they're going to go through a military campaign to completely eradicate the organization or just kind of try to co-opt it and leave it be. I think even if they do go for a military operation, they'll probably try to co-opt a lot of its members first 
so that they're just going after like a core heretical um, group that they can easily um, um, push aside. Um, so I, I'm not terribly worried about Islamic state attacks against the United States. Um, that, that's not something that, that greatly concerns me because of the way that things have worked out in Afghanistan. It's good to have some positive uh, assessments these days. Um, the, so the Taliban announced its government this morning, and I'm wondering what your analysis is uh, of that, that announcement, the implications of, of who got what positions, of, of how the announcement, what, is your, what, is your, what are some of your takeaways about that really pivotal announcement that we've all been sitting on the edge of our seats waiting for? <laughs> yes, all, all of us Afghan experts. Yeah, on the edge of our seats. anyway. <laughs> uh, the... Uh, so for one thing, it argues against that they're trying to really form a, um, a compromised government here. Right? So these are entirely Taliban members in, in the main positions. Um, there's Hamid Karzai, Abdullah, and their supporters are nowhere to be seen in this. There's no Tajiks to be seen in this other than the Tajiks who have been with the Taliban for a long period of time. Um, the offensives against Panjshir over the past few days kind of make it clear they never really had a sincere intention. Um, to bring Tajiks in, in, into the government. So we can take it that this is not, this is not a compromised government. What powers they may give to a parliament over budgeting and such, maybe there's something left there for some kind of compromise, but it's not, it's not looking good in, in, in that regard. Um, is the government going to be an Islamic emirate like in the 1990s, or is it gonna be a government just with an Islamic foundation? Mm -hmm. Are they going to use that name of the emirate again? Is it going to have the same kind of structure? Is it going to be a little different? Now, that's, a, that's somewhat of a bigger question. Um, and it's somewhat of a bigger question because we didn't see uh, Muli Hebatula, the leader of the emirate, say anything about these appointments. Um, it wasn't issued like his um, speeches have been after, after major holidays, such as Kuchne Eid or Loya Eid or after Ramazan on where an announcement is put out, it's clearly supposed to be from him as a leader of the organization. That, that, that hasn't happened um, in this case. So one of the things that Taliban have to be worried about is that surrounding countries, Russia, China, Iran, said they don't want to see the return of the emirate. Um, so it is possible they decided not to do that, but to try to keep the rest of the trappings of the emirate in place, but just not the name and the title mm. and, and such. Now, on the other hand, they could be intending on keeping and keeping Moli Hebatullah. It just could simply be that that's not how this, that this went down. Hmm. But that becomes a, one of the large questions um, about, this, about this new government. We also shouldn't discount that, that in Afghanistan, you know, it, things may not be as official as they look right now. There may be other movement that, that's going to occur that we just can't see. So it's interesting. I'll leave it as seem to have been so committed to the Islamic Emirates title for so many years that 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 absence is, is sort of interesting in and of itself of how, whether or not that is a move to compromise to get international acceptance and sort of that debate of how much it will adjust to get international acceptance. Yeah, the other thing I didn't do was I didn't listen to Zabi. I started listening to Zabi al Mujahid, but since this came out about an hour ago when he was announcing it, I wasn't able to listen to the whole thing to see if he was using, if he was saying Islamic Emirate and what terms he was using to describe people in, in, in the role. So, like Muhammad Hassan Akun, he's named in it as the director, as the Rais of, of the Taliban. Um, and it's not entirely clear if that means he's the Emir like he's replacing Habitula, or if he's really filling the role that Baradar filled, that Mansour filled under Omar, um, where they're executing, they're executing and managing um, the, the, the organization. So that, that's a little unclear. I think we'll get some more clarity on that over time. Muhammad Hassan himself, of course, is not, is a name that, who you and I kind of know, but he's not a common name. Um, you know, he was, he was a founding member of the Taliban. He was supposedly close to Mullah Omar. Um, he was a part of the Quetta Shura or the Robbery Shura Leadership Council established in 2003, and he eventually became head of it. Um, it said in the 90s that he advised against um, working with Al Qaeda and advised to you know, kind of distance the movement, the, the emirate itself from Al Qaeda. But we don't, I don't have enough firm evidence on that to say if that's truly really the case or not. Um, so, you know, a respected figure not a figure that we necessarily have a lot of information on that he's going to be extremist or anything like that, but, but harder to say. I mean, we'll, we'll see how this plays out. 
it is a reminder that people who are um, very well known to outside analysts and those who are well known within the movement can sometimes be different. This comes up with, with other organizations as well. It's, uh, there, there can be distinctions there, but it, it definitely an interesting, some interesting um, notes of who got what positions within the government. On the lessons learned side, we have a couple of questions from the audience about how we approach developing the Afghan government forces. You mentioned the pervasive problems of corruption. Would you say that there were also problems in, in our overall approach in trying to build this, this sort of centralized, large-scale army, or was that the, uh, the best approach available, but the execution of it was the problem? So there were a lot of problems in our approach. Uh, the number one problem is that early on, we didn't build a military fast enough. And that could have been a military that was large or a military that was elite and high quality. We didn't manage to do either. Um, for a variety of reasons, we waited too long to make the decision. We didn't put the, the, the money towards it that should have been put toward it. Um, sometimes had the wrong advisors in place. So that was a, that's a problem that afflicted it throughout. Um, it's hard to say right now exactly what structure of military should have been built, a centralized versus more decentralized. So one of the things we can see from Afghanistan and Iraq um, is that one of the things that, that we do especially well is build special operations forces for the forces we're working with. And they tend to perform better than the other forces are. So from the base of the information that I have now, I'd say, first of all, that, that that's, would be number one investment to make. Now, number, and you go beyond that, you, need, you can't just have special operations forces, you need more than that. But is it better to have local forces that are locally recruited fighting in their local areas, say like the, I mean, the, the uh, Afghan local police is the obvious example for Afghanistan, but it might be easier to think of it more in terms of like Shia militia mm. um, in, in Iraq or the Northern Alliance mm -hmm. um, in Afghanistan in 2001. Should you, we fund those kind of organizations, which can have some real identity and esprit de corps because they're defending their local areas, but they have problems of being as, as, as well trained and tend to abuse the population. Not every unit does that, but you know, if we average it, then, then there's that, that's going to be happening. Um, you know, so is that the right way to go, or is it better to form the kind of more formal arm that we created in Afghanistan and we created in Iraq? both of which didn't perform very well under pressure. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure we have the best answer to this. I guess the, the, the end thing I'd say to this, to this point is that you know, no matter how we train the, the existing evidence here, so no matter how well we train the Afghan army, no matter how well we built them, that they were still gonna have great difficulty against the Taliban. So um, when we, if we, we shouldn't think that if we had just built something a little better, done mm -hmm. some training a little better, advised a little better, that that would have resulted in success. Because the available evidence says, no, it wouldn't have. Could it have made things cheaper? Could it have saved lives? Could it have enabled the government to last for longer? Yes, perhaps it could have. But in terms of victory, it, it, there's just not enough evidence to suggest that. There's, um, we have questions coming in fast and furious, so I'll try to try to take a few and, and put them into um, overarching questions. And so there's a, a new uh, Washington term of over the horizon counterterrorism. And so there's a lot of discussion about what that is, what that means, how effective that will be. And I guess the question that comes out of it is if you were trying to design a way for the U.S. to uh, protect its counterterrorism equities in Afghanistan, what would be the elements of it that you would try to put into place given the conditions in Afghanistan? I'm, gonna, I'm asking the easy questions um, while, while I have you here. <laughs> well, I mean, Trisha, you, 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 know, you know as much about the over the horizon capability and, and, and all of the elements of it as I do. So you're certainly um, an expert on that. And I welcome your criticism to what I'll say now about how we should do um, you know, CT and such. Um, given the situation right now, um, I mean, yes, we should maintain some kind of over the horizon capability. Um, but I mean, the Taliban control a lot of ground um, that I don't think was expected um, earlier on when the over the horizon capability was first discussed. We, you know, you'd still have more Afghan allies on the ground um, than, in, than is the case now. Um, but the, the capability exists, um, so it, it should be executed. I think we can work with. Um, the other regional countries about the concerns of, about terrorism to a certain extent. We should continue working with them because it, it's possible that they are going to be concerned enough to do something about it. It's possible that they're going to care enough about it. 
and we shouldn't lose that opportunity. It's also possible they don't want to work with us at all right now. Um, that that but they really just want to see the United States out of the region and don't really care about terrorism right now. They may care about it in the future, but right now they don't care about it. But nevertheless, I think it's worthwhile to go working about. But I guess you know, for me, what it comes down to is resilience. For me, um, well, defense and resilience. A lot of it depends on our ability to defend the United States, to look at our own. I don't want to use the term borders so much, but look at our homeland and being able to provide an effective defense of it and prevent terrorist attacks from coming here. Um, depends at home on dissuading people who might be inspired by any kind of resurgence of Al Qaeda or the Taliban to conduct attacks here. And it requires resilience. That when an attack occurs in the United States to understand it's not the end of the world, um, that it's probably not as, it's not as damaging as COVID. It's probably not as damaging as various tragic events we see it happening in schools in the United States. Probably not as tragic as the number of car accidents we see happen. Well, not as tragic as that. Um, I don't mean to devalue the, the threat of terrorism or the people who have lost their lives in terrorist attacks, um, which, is, which is horrible and awful, and we've, we've done a lot to try to stop. Um, but from looking at the terrorist threat that's likely to come out of Afghanistan right now, its magnitude is not likely to be very great. Therefore, we should look at enduring it, being resilient to it, and not thinking that we're going to need to go back into Afghanistan or Iraq or anywhere else if such an attack occurs. Um, I think that would be a better way to move forward with our strategy um, post Afghanistan. We have a, a good question here about how the US should engage uh, with the Taliban going forward. There's indications we will not have an embassy, at least at this point. Um, what kind of diplomatic approach should, would you recommend the US take towards the, the Taliban government? And, and in what areas should the US, does the US have some leverage to, to get um, the Taliban to, to moderate its behavior? Overall, I think our rela any relation with the Taliban is gonna be very frustrated. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be very difficult um, for us. I think the Taliban, they have deep connections to Al Qaeda. Now, like I said, I don't think Al Qaeda ha is, is, is a great threat, but they have deep connections there. And that's gonna make them resistant to doing all the things that we would like them to do. They weren't willing to do everything we wanted seen done when we were saying we were gonna withdraw all, all our forces. So I don't really see how money or international recognition is gonna change a lot of that. We know that, the, that using money and using, um, that using the possibility of recognition condition that wasn't sufficient to get them to agree to have any kind of compromised government or political settlement. So once they're in power, these kind of levers probably aren't going to get that much. Furthermore, the Taliban will be incentivized. I assume many of you are familiar with the political science principal agent model on uh, that they'll be incentivized to keep these problems in existence so they can keep on getting money from us. Um, and they'll have lots of reasons not to go the whole way. In addition, our leverage from this money will be undercut because Pakistan will give them money. China, China, Russia, Iran may or may not give them money, but they'll be more likely to do so if they know that we are trying to get the Taliban to be cooperative with us. That will increase the chances that they will interfere there. And then the more money the Taliban get from other sources, the less they'll be interested in our money. Um, you know, President Biden said, we have no interest in Afghanistan. Or we have few real interests in Afghanistan. And I, I agree with that. If we have few real interests in Afghanistan, we shouldn't be worried about forming a partnership with the Taliban. Mm. It shouldn't be important to us. Now, that does, I mean, I think some kind of relationship, yes, there'll be some kind of relationship with the Taliban. Um, it, it, whether that's official or, or, or unofficial, I mean, there's very few countries we don't have some kind of relationship with. Um, I, I could see how we uh, reopen an embassy in Afghanistan. I could even see how we recognize the Taliban. But I also see that different from that we're forming a partnership with them to try to counter terrorism or try to promote democracy or protect women's rights in Afghanistan. I just see those as highly unlikely to happen, which then makes me say, why do I want to exert the energy into it? Mm -hmm. Why do I want Secretary of State Blinken to be spending his valuable time traveling to Doha or traveling to Kabul to talk to the Taliban versus dealing with China or dealing with Russia? Um, we have a, a question here about how the Taliban has, at least in its international rhetoric, 
seems to be able to um, present itself as a more acceptable, more um, um, palatable uh, entity and how much that international, that increased international savviness and rhetoric reflects what, what the Taliban is really like on the ground and how it will actually operate on the ground. Is there, is there a gulf between those two things or do those international voices reflect uh, the power dynamics within the Taliban? Um, so the Taliban are portraying themselves differently and they are different from the 1990s. Um, they do care about administering the country. They realize they didn't administer it well in the past and they know they, they, they should get some kind of international um, support. I don't think they feel as strongly as they did in the 1990s about the oppression of women. Um, so that's why they have some more girls schools open. That's why they say they're willing to have some um, women go to, go to war. I think they recognize more the dangers of letting Al Qaeda attack um, other countries from Afghanistan or at least a variety of their members do. So I think these are some these are some fair differences between it between the Taliban and, of today and, and, and yesteryear. But also, I mean, just like you said, just like you alluded to, they are not what they are portraying themselves to be. Um, we've seen them beat women um, this morning or today in Afghanistan. Um, we've seen them shoot women. We know they've conducted reprisals against people who work with the government or work with us, not systematic, but reprisals nevertheless. We've already talked about relationships that they have with, uh, with Al Qaeda. Um, so they're, they're not as clean as they would like to be portrayed as. And I suspect that will eventually cause them, it, it will cause them difficulties with us early and will probably cause them difficulties with the, within the region um, over time. They are likely to have friction with the Hazars. The Taliban have always had friction with the Hazars who are Shia. Iran is the defender of all Shia. This is a source of friction between the two um, over time. The Taliban won't be able to, I don't think they'll be able to stop this. I don't think they'll be able to stop the reprisals that will go on. Um, and, and this is gonna make it difficult for them to receive the kind of international recognition uh, that they would like. Uh, there's a question here um, that is, is, I think, particularly interesting when we talk about the, the galvanizing um, cause for the Taliban being the sort of activation of an anti-occupation um, Afghan identity. With, that, with the U.S. withdrawal, does it lose a lot of its resonance, um, either internally as an organization or with the Afghan people, when you, when you extract that, that really central component to how it was able to get um, fighters, recruitment, support, and, and morale within the organization? So that was a really big question on um, before August 12th or 13th. Yes. <laughs> so there was a thought that the, the, the government might be able to legitimize itself more once we were gone. Um, and if you look at the Soviet withdrawal in 1988 and how the Najibullah regime of the time that had previously been communist managed to repaint itself as nationalistic, as fighting for Afghanistan. Now they weren't able to do it entirely, but they were able to do it enough. Plus, once the common enemy of the Soviets left, the, the Mujahideen themselves fractured a bit. A lot, of their a lot of their forces preferred to stay in the provinces and not fight. Um, other ones, uh, other ones would disagree with each other, and they wouldn't be able to coordinate well. Um, but so, looking at when, uh, you know, in July, a lot of people thought this was a possibility that this could happen, but it didn't happen. It didn't happen partly because uh, the government was severely painted as our as as tied to us um, because of how it had come about, because of the years of support. Um, so it still was painted that way. The Taliban were also far more cohesive than the old Mujahideen were. Yes. They have a, a far greater ethos of unity. Um, we don't want to overplay that, but they were extremely sensitive towards fractures in their organization and making sure that, that those fractures would be minimized. Um, so that's part of it as well. And then the, the military speed of the collapse meant there wasn't any time for the government to exploit the opportunity to be not connected to us. They never had the time to uh, repaint themselves. Um, so in the end, that, um, that, that, didn't, that didn't play, that, that didn't happen. Now, if the Panjshir resistance continues to exist and it exists without um, support from the outside, it may have a different ability to um, generate identity, especially with the Tajik community. Mm -hmm. But the fate of the, the Panjshir resistance right now is a bit in question. Um, 
and we'll we'll see what happens there. Um, my my final question for you is that this might be one that reveals uh, the political scientist in me and the historian in you will will rebuff this a little bit, but. When you think about the lessons learned or, or positive or negative out of Afghanistan that we should take forward into other places or we should not take forward in other places, right? There's a lot of big pronouncements going on right now about what, what we learned in Afghanistan and I can see the implications for Somalia and Mali and other places. And, and sometimes I think there, there are valid lessons and sometimes I think there were things that were specific to Afghanistan. So I wonder what you would say in terms of, of lessons the U.S. national security apparatus should take uh, about Afghanistan going forward and, and what aspects of it really are specific to Afghanistan and don't apply other places. I know you have experience in Iraq and other places too, so maybe you can you can shed some light into that or you can chastise my political science uh, <laughs> thinking on it. No, no, we, we both, uh, the, the, I, I, it's a good question to ask. It, it, it's a necessary question to ask even to historians. Um, if I was to play this really, if I was looking really from a strategic level, the first thing I think is you look at Iraq, look at Afghanistan, it's worth considering that if one is going to go into an intervention on in, in a place like Iraq or Afghanistan, but maybe even in place in Africa, maybe even in Central or Central South America, that there's great challenges to having complete success. The countries have certain dynamics, certain things that are going on that when we were there, we can suppress yeah. and we can reduce these causes of instability. But when we leave, the dynamics are so deep that they are, there's a good chance they're going to come back. So that means when one is thinking about strategy, one should be thinking about, well, we're going to have to stay a long time. And any big successes we make are unlikely to last a, a, after we leave, especially if we invest a lot of money into it. So that hopefully pushes us more toward thinking about how do we stay in a country for a long time in a way that's not expensive, in a way that doesn't cost a lot of American lives. That, of course, is probably going to mean that the insurgents or the opposition, the adversary, they'll continue to be there during that time. They won't be removed. But we have certain interests we want to secure What's the minimum that we can put down over a long period of time to secure those interests? Keeping in mind again, that when we leave, those interests are likely to be in danger. Now, time too is expensive. Staying somewhere for a long time is expensive. So that should also cause pause in the very idea of intervention. Make us think that, well, maybe we don't need to intervene. Maybe we can just deal with it. Maybe again, we can just be resilient. Because we're not gonna totally solve the problem. We're not gonna solve it quickly. Um, so it should in, instill a good amount of caution in our thinking. And I think those are, those are the large strategic takeaways I take from Afghanistan and, and Iraq. I think one of the things I've concerned, that I'm a little concerned about is that what happened in Afghanistan will discredit the idea of negotiations. Uh, the outcome in Afghanistan will make the idea of negotiating with, with some of these groups um, particularly unpalatable. Um, and, and that that may be a, a strategic problem. Do you, do you think that my concern is, is uh, well-founded or is this, again, a case of Afghanistan is, an, is its own situation? I think it will cause greater, I, I do think it will cause greater opposition to negotiations. And, and I was very in favor of negotiations all the way through, but honestly, it is really hard to look back at it now and, and not wonder if, if maybe negotiations didn't help us very much. Mm -hmm. if, if maybe we just should have left and not even had all the, the, all the various points on negotiation, all the things we tried to do. Um, it, it makes one wonder if, if talking to the Taliban that long didn't legitimize them in some way. But I, I do wanna reiterate that I've, I was strongly in favor of negotiations for a very long time. Um, and it's not something that I would want to give up on um, very easily, but I think you're right, it will generate opposition. I think that um, the, putting out a book in July 2021 about the American war in Afghanistan, you have done a, a, a tremendous service uh, to those who are now grappling with, with what happened. And I, a lot of people who maybe weren't that interested in Afghanistan before, I noticed in my classes, there's a lot more interest in my students on Afghanistan. And 
Um, I think that I can't recommend the book highly enough. I think it doesn't <laughs> look well on my screen, but as I say, I have highlighted significant portions of it. So I'm not sad I went with the Kindle version of it. I already saw somebody talking in the chat about how it was sold out where they were trying to buy it. So that is, that's a great sign as well, um, Carter. I really congratulate you on a really important book um, at a very, I think both of us could say a very painful time for those of us who have worked on Afghanistan, a real sense of profound loss um, as, as a country and, and as people who worked on this, but the ability to provide such, such deep um, and important insights into the conflict, I think is, 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 uh, is really commendable. And I really congratulate you on this fantastic book. And we appreciate you coming today and answering these questions. And I, we, we didn't get to all of them and I have more, but um, I recommend everybody read uh, Dr. Malkazian's book to, to learn a lot about what happened and how we got to where we are, especially going into the 9-11 anniversary on Saturday. So thank you very much, Carter. Thank you, Professor Baker. Thank you for all the work you've done on to help <laughs> us deal with terrorist threats and to, to expand the knowledge of counterterrorism. It's great that you're there at American University for the students to be able to continue to talk about these things because we know terrorism isn't going away um, anytime soon. Um, and thank you for all the students and faculty and, and folks who've been listening today. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's all greatly appreciated. Um, and uh, thanks for the service. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, be, take care, good care, be well. And um, I let me know if uh, there's other topics that would be interesting to you to have sessions on. I'm happy to, to try to find, there won't be anyone as good as Carter, but uh, in different issues, uh, we can find other people to come talk about pressing issues as well. So with that, good afternoon, everyone. Um, enjoy the rest of your day and thank you again.